Good evening, everyone. Today, we are dealing with a topic that we don't often talk about. You're familiar with a lot of advances which are happening in the field of genetics. This particular talk I have delivered at the annual conference of the PCSI, which concluded in Bangalore last month. Why are we talking about this topic? You know that in the last few decades, there have been tremendous advances in the field of human genetics. And we know that mutations related to congenital heart disease, they involve a, a very widely heterogeneous set of molecules that would influence cardiac development. These mutations produce their effect at the biochemical level by modifying the dose of the gene or the protein. And majority of congenital heart disease is sporadic, but this concept would change with every passing day. With the current techniques of genetics that are being employed, the genetic basis of a larger number of diseases is being understood. And one area where there is rapid advance is translational genomics. In case you're not familiar with this jargon, translational genomics means applying discoveries in the genetics laboratory to human care. And the pediatric cardiac community today needs to constantly update the clinical relevance of these discoveries and how it would influence congenital heart disease management. In this talk, I've organized it to deal with them um, congenital heart diseases with a genetic approach. And based on that approach, we would see how representative diseases in each group, the genetic diagnosis would be modifying surgical outcome. In fact, as far as pediatric cardiologists are concerned, apart from the intellectual interest in genetics, the key question that you and me would ask if this child has one particular genetic abnormality and a cardiac lesion, the next child does not have this genetic abnormality, it has a cardiac lesion. Both of them undergo the same cardiac surgery. Is there any difference? The fact that our child A has a genetic syndrome, has it modified the surgical outcome? You would be surprised to note that there is an amazing amount of information that is accumulated in answering this question in the last 10 years. And that is the trigger for this talk. We need to integrate genetic information to clinical practice. I'll refer to translational genomic medicine. This is best illustrated in the care of Marfan syndrome and the recent advances with regard to that. And we will conclude how best we can utilize genetic information in predicting patients' outcome. So why is genetic information important? There may be other organ system involvement. You say it is Williams syndrome. You have supravalvar AS. You know that you need to look for pulmonary artery stenosis. There may be prognostic information for clinical outcomes. I'll be dealing with that. You may need to screen other family members, something that you're familiar with. There may be a significant reproductive risk. I'm not dealing with this, but the focus is on the selected conditions that exhibit a significant difference in surgical outcomes based on the presence or absence of genetic abnormality. I said we will follow a genetic classification to congenital heart disease for the convenience of this talk. One group of genetic abnormalities, perhaps the one that we have talked about for the longest period of time in medicine, they are chromosome number variations or aneuploidies. Aneuploidies are chromosome number variations. Down syndrome and Turner syndrome, you are very familiar with. Trisomy 13 and trisomy 18 are the dreaded aneuploidies that a neonatologist is looking at. Let's start with them. Traditionally, Trisomy 13 and 18 are not offered surgery in the most of the areas of the world. That this diagnosis constitutes an indication to withhold 
or denied treatment, but not necessarily so uh, in the developed world. So much so, the Harvard group came out with some rules of thumb as to how to approach complex anomalies and the consideration for surgery. If the surgery is clearly beneficial to the child as a whole, they recommended that you could do it even against the wishes of parents, not recommended for India. This is an American recommendation. This will not work in India. But there is a message there. And if it does not, you could withhold or withdraw treatment. In India, we would rather go by the, the fact that there is a gross anomaly, the child is not going to survive, or the, the chances of survival are so low that you don't entertain the prospect of surgery at all. But why did these recommendations come in? This is because in the last 20 years, some centers have been offering surgery to trisomy 13 and 18. What happened? In one series, they found that if you aggressively treat them, including surgery and aggressive uh, PICU care, the one-year survival could increase from 5% to 25%. In fact, the one-year survival of trisomy 13 and 18 is less than 5% in most of this, in or rather all the series that is published. But by offering aggressive surgery, you can prolong their survival to the age of one or to the two, or to the age of two in a small number. I refer to this only to say a gross instance where a surgical outcome is modified by a genetic diagnosis. We know that the basic surgical lesions in trisomy 13 and 18 are nothing great. You have conditions like VSD and uh, tetralogy of fallow. So these conditions you would expect would have a normal survival in a normal person. But in presence of trisomy 13 and 18, even though the lesions look small, lesions look simple, they do not allow survival in a significant number. Let's deal with Down syndrome, which you are more familiar with. The cardiac lesions of Down syndrome are well known to all of you. The prototype lesion is AV canal family, either complete AV canal defect or some form of AV canal defect. But you could also have in an equal number, simple ventricle, perimembranous ventricular septal defect, atrial septal defect, PDA, tetralogy, uh, everything. So if patient A has Down syndrome, patient B is non-syndromic, they have the same lesion, how do they behave in response to surgery? My group had done a study and published a few years ago from Chennai, and we did a case control study in a small number and found that there was a significantly higher duration of ICU stay and ventilation for all lesions in Down syndrome, but mortality was not altered. This is also the STS database data from United States. In over 4,300 children, Down syndrome surgery showed that mortality was not increased, but ICU stay was longer. There was a higher incidence of complete heart block and infectious complications were more. The higher incidence of complete heart block can be explained because you are dealing essentially with an inlet BSD with an abnormal location of the conduction system in the anterosuperior portion of the VSD. So the Down syndrome child has a greater chance of staying longer in the ICU and developing a complete heart block and developing an infection following surgery, but mortality not altered. This is in the acute results of surgery. What about long-term results? Reoperations for AV valve regurgitation is less common, less common in Down syndrome as against a non-Down child. To amplify that point, think of a complete AV canal in a non-Down child versus a Down child. The valve quality, as the surgeons would call, is worse in the non-Down child. The Down syndrome has sturdier valves. So the risk of reoperation, particularly for mitral regurgitation, is much more in the non-down child 
down child has a less chance of re being reoperated for mitral regurgitation. Of course, Down syndrome specific issues that might come in the long term would include uh, in situations like pulmonary hypertension and leukemia. The other aneuploidy that you deal with is Turner syndrome. And there's a large pediatric cardiac care consortium database from the United States to answer the question, does Turner syndrome influence surgical outcome? What are the common surgical problems in Down syndrome? They are left, I'm sorry, in Turner syndrome, they are left heart obstructive lesions. The left heart obstructive lesions can be a subaortic membrane, LVOT obstruction, or coarctation of aorta. Worst cases, hypoplastic left heart. The hospital stay and the outcomes are comparable for procedures of interest in Turner syndrome and non-Turner children. So if you have a subaortic stenosis or if you have a coarctation, the presence of Turner syndrome does not modify the surgical outcome. It does not. However, if you have a hypoplastic left heart syndrome, it's bad enough. But if it's a hypoplastic left heart in a Turner, there is a higher mortality for Norwood. A known Turner undergoing a hypoplastic left heart sur surgery has a greater chance of survival than a Turner. Curiously, in the Pediatric Cardiac Care Consortium database, they found that partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection also carried a greater mortality in Turner syndrome, which is not explained. Remember that hypoplastic left heart syndrome is more than three and a half times common in Turner syndrome than in non-Turner syndrome, and it carries a greater mortality. Any questions that you want to raise at this point? I don't find anything in the chat. If you have anything to ask, please keep sending your questions. Now we group, move to another group of diseases, which is due to abnormal chromosomal structure. Here what we mean is the chromosome numbers are not altered, but there is a portion which is deleted or which is altered, which is detectable by a genetic test. And the classic example of that is 22Q11 deletion, which results in conotrungal anomalies. Williams syndrome is a 7P deletion, which also is an abnormal chromosomal structure. If you look at the genetics of conotrungal anomalies, which is not the focus of my discussion, the conotrungal anomalies are a group of disorders that result from abnormal outflow tract septation. The outflow tract cells come from either the cardiac neural crest or from the second heart field. And there may be a few from the endocardium, which gives rise to the endocardial um, cushions. The anomalies which are listed in conotrungal anomalies would include interrupted aortic arch, trungus, tetralogy, Isolated aortic arch anomalies, DORV, TGA, all these come under the category of conotrungal anomalies. The test that you most commonly employ to identify them is a FISH test for 22Q11 deletion. And if you look at the frequency of 22Q11 deletion, it is highest for interrupted aortic arch followed by trungus arteriosus. These two have the highest. In uh, interrupted aortic arch, it is more than 50%, the frequency of deletion. In trungus, it's about 35 to 40 percent. The other ones, among the other lesions, tetralogy has a higher incidence. It is 8 to 15 percent, non-syndromic patients. There is a variable incidence for the different lesions, and the lowest incidence is for TGA. You know the general somatic features of 22Q11 deletion, which is the hallmark of the, the Dijor syndrome. It has gone under various names, the narrow palpable fissure, cleft palate, straight nose, white nasal root, small mouth, thin lips, absent thymus, hypocalcemia, speech problems, psychiatric disorders. All these are part of the spectrum of 22Q11 deletion. And the cardiac lesions, we have already referred to the different 
lesions, beginning with intrapriotic arc and trunchus and tetralogy. Uh, even simple perimembranous VSD could be a, considered as a conotrungal anomaly. How does this diagnosis of a being fish positive in a conotrungal anomaly influence the operative mortality? That is the to, question to discuss which we introduce this background. The first information that fish positivity for 22Q11 deletion could adversely alter the outcome of conotrungal heart defects came from an Italian study where some 350 patients were studied, all of them being evaluated by a clinical geneticist with a karyotyping and a fish for 22Q11. There were 61 patients with genetic syndromes of fish 27 for 22Q11. They found that the overall mortality was higher in syndromic patients than in non-syndromic patients, but this was not statistically significant. However, once the child had a 22Q11 deletion, there's a higher mortality, and this was significant. And further subgroup analysis demonstrated that this risk was confined to pulmonary atresia VSD and interrupted aortic arch. Among the other chromosomal anomalies noted in this study, Down syndrome was not a risk factor for surgery, as we have already discussed earlier. But other genetic syndromes like charge or vascular was associated with a higher mortality. Because of the finding with regard to pulmonary atresia VSD, there was a separate study on pulmonary atresia VSD and its surgical outcome. So here again, there's say 20 patients with fish positive and 38 patients who are fish negative and their surgical outcome was compared. All of them had pulmonary atresia VSD. It was found that fish positive patients had significantly greater prevalence of MAPCAS and they had poorer development of pulmonary arteries. The pulmonary arteries were more hypoplastic. It was Nakata index which was applied and the Nakata index was lower in fish positive patients. So fish positive pulmonary atresia VSD has more MAPCAS, smaller pulmonary arteries. This impacts survival. Five years later, if you see how they are doing, the five year survival was only 36% for fish positive patients. It is 90% in fish negative patients. It's a remarkable difference. So the main factor responsible for mortality was pulmonary artery hypoplasia. You could think that these are DGOS patients and therefore they could have bacterial, viral or fungal infections. These were not, repeat, not the reason for the increased incidence of mortality in these patients. I want you to take a look at this angiogram. This is a five-year-old boy who is fish positive for 22Q11 deletion. He had a BT shunt on day two. At one year, he had a conduit repair for pulmonary atresia VSD. At three years, we have tetitrized this patient because his RV pressures were hypertension. We thought there's a pulmonary artery obstruction we could perhaps relieve it. What we found is that the pulmonary arteries are uniformly hypoplastic. See the, the contrast in size between the conduit and the pulmonary arteries. They're small. This is a five year, three year old child at the time of uh, the study. So the strikingly hypoplastic pulmonary arteries are the reason why there is right ventricular hypertension. There is no obstruction. Yet another surgical outcome that we look for is neurodevelopmental outcome. There is a lot of interest on neurodevelopmental outcome after complex neonatal heart surgery. And a Canadian study addressed the question, the neonatal complex cardiac surgery does have a risk of adverse neurodevelopmental outcome anyway. Does 22Q11 deletion worsen this risk? They made a case control study looking at the various Bailey scale parameters, the mental development index and psychomotor development index. 
in 16 patients with a, a fish positive and 16 patients who are negative. This table compares the first one, group A, is fish positive, and group B is fish negative. You will find that mortality is higher in the fish positive patients and lower scores for mental development index and the psychomotor development index, they are more in fish positive patients. So, neurodevelopmental outcome is adverse in fish positive patients. Who are, who are, are you asking me any question or is this a crosstalk? Point that we were making, neurodevelopmental outcome is worse in children who are fish positive who undergo cardiac surgery. And in yet another study, clinical and functional developmental outcomes in neonates undergoing fungus repair was done. It's a recent publication. This has come out with very interesting data. There were 36 infants who underwent fungus repair, and five of them had associated interrupted arch also. 13 of them had chromosomal anomalies, and 10 was 22 Q11 deletion. The remaining three were down. There were eight deaths, and uh, ICU stay and ventilation duration were similar. Rehospitalization for known cardiac causes were more frequent in the chromosomal anomalies group like recurrent infections and uh, pediatric admissions for that was more in the chromosomal anomalies group. But the, and also sorry, the neurodevelopmental outcome was assessed by uh, different ways and uh, they followed the general adaptive composite score. And the GSC score was significantly lower in the chromosomal anomalies group. And they also found that deep hypothermic circulatory arrest was not the reason for the lower GAC scores, DHCA did not influence the GAC scores. The most important and insightful information that we get from this study is regarding re-interventions. When you operate on a trungus, one of your main worries is re-operation for conduit replacement in childhood. At five years in this study, the freedom from re-intervention was 70% if there was no chromosomal anomaly and really 90% if there was a, a chromosomal abnormality. In other words, 19 out of 22 in re-interventions, which were conduit changes, generally happened in the fish negative people. Importantly, 22 Q11 deletion children were less likely repeat less likely to require a conduit replacement in childhood. Why is this? There are two explanations which the authors have forwarded. One, why is it that you need to replace a conduit at all? It's not only that the child is increasing in size, but the conduit is being rejected. Being a xenograft or a homograft, the body mounts a chronic rejection reaction against it. And this rejection reaction is a donor-specific T cell mediated immune response. DJOT patients are T cell deficient. So their T cell deficiency may be prolonging homograph survival in these patients. Also, they are hypocalcemic. And you know that it is calcium deposition, which is an integral component of homograph or the xenograph degeneration. So the patients who do not have 22Q11 deletion, they fare worse as far as re-interventions are concerned. And those who are 22Q11 positive, you replace a conduit less often. I would illustrate this with two cases. Both these cases have been um, under my care for a long period of time. The image that you see is a percutaneous pulmonary valve that has been implanted. At the age of 15, in a boy from Chennai, who has had his Trungus repair in 2001 with a homograft. He never needed a replacement in the next 14 years. At the age of 15, he underwent a percutaneous pulmonary valve. He could have a Melody 18 millimeter valve. In between, he had a pulmonary artery stent. That's all. Conduit was never changed. But this boy is dyslexic 
And at the age of six, his uh, fish was tested and it was found to be positive for 22 to 11 deletion. The family knows uh, his scholastic disabilities and he is under uh, special school uh, training. But he did not have a conduit change. As against this boy, I'm sorry, this uh, image will not move. It shows a chewed up homographed by a bifurcation stenting. This child, born in Abu Dhabi, had uh, original surgery in 1998, but he went on to have conduit replacements in 2001, 2006, and 2013. He had a PA bifurcation stent, which gave him a slightly longer uh, duration for one conduit. This boy is fish negative. He is performing well in school, above average, and he's a drummer in the church choir. So here is a boy who is doing well, who has a better scholastic performance, but repeated conduit replacements, and he is fish negative. Our first child is fish positive, poor scholastic performance, no conduit change. Moving on from this 22-11 deletion to the other important deletion, Williams syndrome. You know the classical features of Williams syndrome. It's a 7P deletion as far as the genetics of that is concerned. You have the, the stellate iris, the flaring eyebrows, periorbital fullness, white mouth, broad lips, the, the cocktail personality, hyperacusis, hoarse voice, abnormal calcium levels. They tend to have both the left and right heart obstructive lesions, classically having supravalvar aortic stenosis and peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis, either or in combination. And the surgical issues that you face with them, the basic abnormality is a 7P11.23 deletion, which involves the elastin gene. And the most uh, surgical information that we have is on management of supravalvar AS. Repeat congenital heart disease can present with can present with recurrence of new lesion in expected sites. Half of them have hypertension in, adult, in, in adulthood. The genetic diagnosis allows you to recognize the comorbid conditions and to plan the educational strategy. It's an autosomal dominant disorder. As far as surgery is concerned, there are excellent early results for supravalvar AS with 86% survival at 15 years. And the best results are for multi sinus patch aortoplasty. For supravalvar aortic stenosis, when you widen the, the affected region, the most uh, used surgery or the best results are for the three patch aortoplasty introduced by Professor Broom. The two patch technique or the Doty's technique, these are the other techniques which are employed. The multi sinus patch aortoplasty has better surgical results. The long-term results are generally related to the technique of aortic valve, uh, sorry, the, the aortic the plasty rather than to the presence of Williams syndrome. However, the occurrence of peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis in patients who have undergone supravalvar aortic stenosis is a direct result of the diagnosis of Williams syndrome. They do have a significant late mortality and morbidity. And... Uh, Peripheral PS intervention would be indicated if only RV pressures are significantly high. Peripheral PS in Williams, it, at a small age, when if it is present in infancy, we do a balloon dilatation. Slightly older, we try to use a cutting balloon. And still older children, we could use a pulmonary artery stenting. In some children, it improves with time also. This is a typical patient with Williams syndrome. She has undergone surgery for supravalvar aortic stenosis. What we would be concerned in her, apart from what happens to her iota, is this. What this shows, what the angiogram shows is a, a cutting balloon angioplasty for peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. What you see here is multiple lobar arteries and segmental arteries which are stenotic. And uh, in the uh, moving image that you see, it's a cutting balloon angioplasty for the segmental arteries that you see. Uh, 
uh, there is a question in practice should we offer surgery to a child with positive fish with immune deficiency i'll i'll answer this question when i am concluding now we move to a different category of genetic disorders which are single gene mutations and congenital heart disease the remember originally we dealt with the abnormal chromosome number then abnormal chromosomal structure now we are dealing with single gene mutations and marfan syndrome is a good example of the single gene mutations that we deal and it also illustrates the advancing frontiers of translational genomics translational genomics means how to use your knowledge from the genetics laboratory to patient care Marfan syndrome you know is due to heterozygous mutation of the FBN1 gene this encodes fibrillin 1 fibrillin 1 is a critical protein that maintains elastin fibers in marfan one the normal fibrillin level is reduced two there is a mutant protein that replaces fibrillin both these would tend to weaken the connective tissue in the iota this leads to aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection in the last of 30 or 40 years there has been some improvement in the outcome of marfan because the ascending aorta surgery aortic root replacement uh, including the valve and required that has improved survival of marfan by about 10 to 15 years and when you find aortic dilatation this does not warrant surgery at this point in time you tend to treat them with beta blockers the idea is to reduce the rate of rise of pressure within the aortic root there is no robust evidence to say that this is beneficial but there is common sense in this prescription and therefore we continue to do that however there is very exciting news with regard to angiotensin receptor 1 blockade why is it exciting the biochemical abnormalities in marfan syndrome translate into clinical abnormalities in marfan we said one problem is the connective tissue weakness and the consequent ascending aortic dilatation mediating this connective tissue weakness is the activity of transforming growth factor beta why is transforming growth factor beta sinister in marfan it promotes fibrillin breakdown as such you have broken down fibrillin it promotes the the connective tissue breakdown and a heightened tgf beta activity is associated with a greater risk of aneurysm formation the normal fibrillin can sequester tgf beta because the normal fibrillin binds with some binding proteins for TG, uh, tgf beta and it keeps away tgf beta while the butane products of fibrillin it does not have this ability and therefore tgf beta activity is more equally important an interesting finding that you find in patients with marfan is that they don't have much muscle mass and however much they might eat their muscles do not build up this is because for the muscles to build you need the ability to convert the satellite cells in the muscles to the myoblast which will diffuse into the into the muscle and constitute new cells to regenerate the muscle mass when it is decreasing or the muscle cells which are uh, dying this process is inhibited by tgf beta now what losartan does or angiotensin receptor 1 blockade does angiotensin 1 receptor stimulation leads to thrombospondin production within the cell thrombospondin is something that increases tgf beta activity so a reduced thrombospondin 1 production increases uh, i'm sorry it suppresses tgf beta activity and this reduces the chance of the aortic dilatation and it improves the muscle mass also so angiotensin 1 receptor blockade is the current uh, 
uh, interest or drug of interest in the management of Marfan syndrome. The other drug which is of interest is doxycycline. Doxycycline, you know, is a tetracycline category antibiotic. What does it do? Doxycycline happens to be a non-specific inhibitor of matrix metalloproteinases. Metalloproteinases are the enzymes that lead down, lead to breakdown of connective tissue. In Marfan, the breakdown fibrillin, it invites a macrophage chemotaxis, and macrophages bring TGF beta with them. So there is a heightened TGF beta activity. Doxycycline inhibits the matrix metalloproteinases, and since it inhibits um, matrix metalloproteinases, the macrophage chemotaxis itself is reduced, and therefore the 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 degradation of the connective tissue is inhibited. So both angiotensin receptor blockade and doxycycline are exciting new pharmacologic modalities in managing Marfan syndrome. There are a number of trials regarding angiotensin receptor blockade in Marfan. And a uh, number of these trials are underway. And the, the fact that so many trials are underway is very exciting. But there is a word of caution. In adult cardiology literature, some evidence has come up showing a non-specific increase in the incidence of cancer death in those who are treated for heart failure and hypertension. After all, ARBs are used more often for hypertension and heart failure. So when you are very much excited by thinking that Marfan can be controlled with uh, angiotensin receptor blockade, you will need to look at this information also. Hopefully, more definite information will, have, will emerge in the years to come. More genetics in Marfan. A microRNA 29B is a small microRNA which regulates apoptosis and extracellular metric synthesis or deposition in Marfan uh, syndrome. In mice, it has been shown that when you give losartan, the levels of microRNA 29B is uh, reduced. So if you block microRNA 29B by specific antisense oligonucleotides, these are small peptides, they can prevent aortic wall apoptosis and the early aneurysm development in mouse and mice. So this may be giving another way to attack the problem of aortic aneurysm in mouse and syndrome. So as I said in the beginning, the Treatment of Marfan syndrome is an excellent case study of advances in translational genomics, and much more will come in the years to come. If you take the issue of aortic dilatation in a little broader sense, Marfan is not the only condition where you deal with aortic dilatation, is it? You also have it in bicuspid aortic valve, you have it in repaired tetralogy of fallow, you have it in coarctation of aorta, you have it following arterial switch. There is a certain common biochemistry, not necessarily genetics, in these conditions. And um, one of the dreaded diseases in childhood with regard to aortic dilatation is lois deep syndrome, which appear in types 1 to 4. I hope some of you are aware of this. This is due to, again, heterozygous mutations in TGF-beta receptor with increased TGF-beta signaling. Classically, you look for a bifid uvula to make a diagnosis of this. It has craniosynostosis, cleft palate, then various non-specific associations. But the point is, they have aneurysm or dissection of the ascending aorta or anywhere else. And arterial tortuosity may also occur as part of this syndrome. Here again, uh, to make the common statements, it, are, it is a specific polymorphism which would predispose the aortic wall to uh, more or less stiffness and dilatation. And metalloproteinases may, can moderate aortic stiffness and aortic dilatation tetralogy of fallow. In lowish deep syndrome where there is aortic aneurysm, a combination of angiotensin receptor blockage and beta blockage may retard progression. And targeted inhibition with small molecules like doxycycline and or ARB may help us in 
managing aortic dilatation in a wider setting in all the conditions listed. So today in the all the known mass fan conditions that I have listed also, angiotensin receptor blockers are used and in some doxycycline is also being used. Feature blockers for non-genetic causes would be used. With this much of information emerging, we need to define when you, are you going to look for cytogenetic testing in infants and children. The AHA scientific statement that came out in 2007 defines that when you have a typical phenotype of a syndrome or when you have a congenital heart disease with dysmorphism or a family history of uh, sudden deaths in their siblings or multiple miscarriages or major cardiac and or other organ malformation, these are all indications for cytogenetic testing. But once you have conotrungal anomaly, your indication for testing for fish is much more liberal. If you have a conotrungal anomaly, for example, in a tetralogy, many units would today routinely check for fish because it has an implication on the long-term management. When you have access to a different diagnostic modality, you know, in genetics today, the microarray analysis is emerged in, it, in different fields. Chromosome microarray analysis can test for about 800,000 genetic markers in one go. Will you use them? There was a study which compared some 535 infants who underwent cardiac surgery undergoing different types of genetic evaluation, simple karyotyping, the chromosomal microarray, fish or a combination. They found that the CMA, the chromosomal microarray study, was associated with a higher yield. This of course increased the cost of treatment, but not to astronomic levels. And uh, the CMA yield was particularly higher in septal defects and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. At present, there are no guidelines as to whether you should be using chromosome microarray analysis in preference to karyotyping and fish testing. But I have no doubt in the next few years this will come. So what is it that we have discussed today? We know that specific genetic syndromes can adversely impact immediate surgical outcome measures. Long-term neurodevelopmental outcome is affected in many genetic syndromes. It's important in counseling. Genetic diagnosis tells the clinician what to anticipate and to look for in different parts of the cardiovascular system itself and in other systems. And we have interesting data on freedom from reintervention in some genetic syndromes. And advances in translational genomic medicine is an area that we are looking forward to with the hope that drugs could modify natural history of depressing conditions like iotopodies. Thank you. I'll deal with your questions.